Guys, welcome back to the Physique Factory podcast. And today we've got special guest Josh Harrison from Team CJM. Um, Josh, you want to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and everything like that? Yeah, no worries, mate. Uh, Josh Harrison, I am well, I was the first coach that Josh McHale took on as part of the expansion of CJM and the rebranding to CJM. Um, I am currently, well, about five months out from possibly my first show of next year. Uh, I've already started some dieting at the moment. Um, but no, I coach basically mainly Josh's lifestyle, but also more competitors now as the seasons are going on. Um, I put on about four four people last year on stage, and I've got a good handful going in onto, the, onto uh, stage next year, which I'm looking forward to. That sort of my girls and guys that I've been sort of building over the last sort of 12 to 24 months. So itching to now get them on stage and see seeing what we can do um but yeah i've been working with josh i've been working with josh McHale as my coach personally for about four years um and i've been working for josh since february of last year i think it was roughly uh when i started and then i've been full-time coaching for cgm since july when i finally got to sack off my council job thank god um because that was somehow balancing the full-time job and like 50 clients at the same time as well so <laughs> but that was a nightmare what what did you do before then like obviously the council but like what did you do there uh so majority of my career was in insurance um all through different types of insurance and then when i went to the council uh initially worked in adult social care just to sort of get my foot in the door and then worked for sort of overseeing all the utility companies so all the utility companies that make everyone's life hell with roadworks constantly i just spent my life finding them so uh be like That's you need to do that right you need to do the that moment, there's that one road in and out of whitworth where i live and the gym's there as well and fucking hell there's four sets of lights on the road as soon as they go down next week there's some fucking up again and there's some at the side of the house and there's just temporary lights everywhere yeah, mate, I completely get it. It's a fucking piss take. And especially since COVID, like everything's on a backlog. So. But yeah, I'm so glad to finally be able to do a career that I actually enjoy and have passion about. And it's like, you know, when everyone says it's like, find something you enjoy and it will never be a day of work. For the first time in nearly 31 years of age, I can finally say that that is definitely the case. Um, and I've loved it ever since. And getting some great results with my clients, my girls. Um, I majority coach females. Um, it's something that I take more of an interest in more so and something I want to specialize in more so than actually men. Don't get me wrong, I still coach men, but for sure, and especially within the industry, I think it's an area that having that focus on females is more important because I think there's a lot of coaches out there that do you know I mean do damage to females and I think females get treated like little men when they're never little men and things like that so something that's one of the reasons why I first joined Josh is because I wanted to learn more about females because I think Josh is easily you could say one of the top female coaches in the industry um and so learning off him sort of for the last sort of four years until he was ready to take me on and I messaged him I was like Every, any when you ever want to expand, I said I want first in, and he was like 100%. 100%. So I'm surprised he's not trying to steal James off me. You know, that <laughs> <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a record yeah. transfer fee if he does go. <laughs> yeah, right. Zero. Take him, get him <laughs> free, free agent. <laughs> as long as I'm compensated, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. but no, that's, that's, like, you've been getting some good results for the females that you've got this year though haven't you yeah um for sure like amy um tone figure she was actually turned it out one of my competition winners where i was just doing like a sort of eight week sort of free coaching and things like this and then next thing you know like 15 weeks later we're stepping around stage at the fucking british finals after winning the previous week prior um she placed I think it was sixth in her first show. And that honestly, that was one of the biggest lineups of tone figure girls I've probably seen all year. Um, and one of the girls actually got moved out of the finals into athletic. Um, so like the, that class was huge. Even everyone was talking about it afterwards going, 
are they toned? But it, <laughs> yeah, but then yeah, she took sixth place. We obviously it was first time putting her on stage, so second show I wanted to have another go before the finals, bring a different look, and I really pushed fullness on her, really pushed food, put a kilo on her, and then voila, just took the first place. So I was buzzing with that, and then I think she took. Sixth at the British, I want to say. Sixth? No, not sixth. Eighth, sorry. Eighth at the British. I had her in first call-outs, but obviously how it goes on the day is you can't. <laughs> you just got to accept it, haven't you? The British for PCA was fucking insane because I did two bros the day before. The standard was so different considering that you was going for a pro card and like two bros. And then PCA, obviously, it's just like PCA, isn't it? But um, the standard was so much better. At PCA than it was for two bros. It's just fucking night and day. Like even the guys who won like the the classic bodybuilding compared to the guy who won the actual overall classic bodybuilding pro card was like they could have smoked the guy who won the pro card the previous day. Yeah, and I think it's like for most the federations in the UK, I think PCA is probably the biggest in the UK in terms of its following and people competing for it. Two bros. Two Bros is a tick box for most people. Like the reality is you go and do a regional and then you go abroad because most of the Two Bros pro qualifiers are just awfully ran shows and like really don't put on a special occasion considering it's a finals or a pro qualifier. And so for that experience and the money that you're paying, I think people just prefer to go abroad. Um, so I think like that's another reason why you definitely don't see the the standard at the finals for these IFBB Two Bros shows compared to like PCA is like, everyone really gets hyped up and like, I mean, obviously you were there at the end of the day on the Sunday and you could see the atmosphere from the crowd, everyone getting hyped up. Like I was there when the disability class was on, like obviously for the whole weekend when the disability class came on, honestly, that was amazing. Like the whole crowd got behind them, was cheering them. Like it was everyone of different abilities, different, even obviously women in with the men as well. Um, and it was just great to see. And they all brought a great package. And it's like, that's why I love going to those PCA shows. And because you get such a hype about everything and everyone's dead supportive. And it's just like, that's why when you go to a, like an IFBB two row show, it's more, it's there. you go for a reason. You go because you're trying to get that card. It's just to tick a box where PCA is much, much more the heart of UK bodybuilding in terms of growing it and what's coming up and Ryan who owns PCA and runs it, runs it amazingly. Do you know what I mean? He, he doesn't let you compete in more than two categories. He makes you obviously choose, he'll choose what best you are. If you step in one class, he'll move you into another class. And I think that's really good. And it's not money orientated. Like the entry fees are some of the lowest out there. Okay, um, cool. class. And it's like what? 170 quid for two bros. So the final I paid for two bros was about just over 400 quid for the Ryan Terry like classic or whatever. And I'd, I did two classes. So I did a novice class and then I did like the um, open class D for men's physique. And yeah, it's all, all like over 400 quid. It's fucking expensive. That, and that is, there's just no need for it at that point. I think it just, and it's an expensive sport already. Do you know what I mean? As we all know, um, as Connor knows, with all those trophies behind him by the looks of things. As well, well. I, I would say um, I paid about 50 quid or something in fees this year, and I was like, fucking hell, that's steep. But compared to you guys, it's fuck all. <laughs> the the nine nine shows have always been reasonable, though. They've always been like fairly cheap. They could probably actually charge a little more compared to like the likes of these, obviously. But yeah, like um, two bros. I've never been to a two bro show and obviously never competed in one, but it's been slagged a lot on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, mate. I'll slag it till home till day <laughs> as well. But yeah, then go and compete with them. <laughs> yeah, next yeah. Coming on, yeah, it, literally, it literally will be my first show of the season next year as well. Will be two bros as well. <laughs> Don't get banned because you can do that by saying shit on social media. I'm pretty sure Nick's banned because the yeah, that's what I was going to say. He said some dodgy things. Yeah, because before. I called someone a fucking pedo in an Instagram post <laughs> like the minute, and I was like, yeah, you can't say that. And next minute, he's blown. <laughs> <laughs> because Nick's very, very opinionated and he's not asked to get his like opinion out there. And yeah. you know, I used to struggle with that at times as well, for sure. It's, it was when I seen that post, um, you know, that guy about reverse band in the hack squat, and what's it what's his name? Andy Scott put it up and he was like, Oh, if you reverse band the hack squat, you're just making it easier. 
And I, I think I sent it to Nick, but I then looked at the comments and Nick was already in them. Oh, he's <laughs> straight in there, yeah. He, <laughs> if he sees something, he sees red straight away and he comments it. Like that thing on uh, Joe Jeffrey's post. So he comment, he tagged me in it as well. So he brought me into the fucking conversation. So well, then I commented and then things started getting fucking heated in the comments and then it was like, for fuck's sake, I was like, we can't win it. And Joe What's Jeffrey was this? like, yeah, but this study says this. I was like, yeah, but he's not a- applicable to real world clients. He's seen that in studies, but you can't apply it to real people. Like this, and those studies, the st- you, like you took a group of people who might be, okay, they might be trained, but what for the done training? So they might be using like resistance machines where it's loading the short like position and, They've been using that for like a continuous amount of time. So they're exposed to loading the short and position. And then when you go into training like length and ranges and you go into like length and partials or whatever, then obviously it's like a novel stimulus. So they're going to be get something from that. So you need to consider all this sort of shit before actually like throwing the studies, like what people are using, what what trainers have been doing for the past like so many years and so on. So it, it goes deep. So you can't just say, Oh yeah, length, length and partials. Everyone should do length and partials because they're more optimal than anything else. But you need to think like, what scenario is it? What person is it? What goal is it? All that sort of shit. But I think it's like as well. It's like if you just die on one method with bodybuilding, you're gonna you're gonna fail very quickly, aren't you? Like I feel like it's there's nothing there's nothing set in stone with anything we do, and especially when it comes to competitive bodybuilding, there's nothing set in stone. You've got to be You've to be the best coach, you've got to be fluid and you've got to be open to numerous different methods and numerous different ideas. And it's like, and I'm I'm don't get me wrong, like I'm I'm big on like science, give me nerdiness, give me all of that, like let me get deep and stuff like this. But like exactly what you said there, JT, it's like what's actually applicable, and that might be the basis of an idea, but then how can you actually applicate that? And then Also, one thing that always resonates with me when I always think about these things and everything like this is uh, it was one of the listening to like one of the Mark Holes podcasts and just talking about business and mindset and everything and approach. And it was how basically like coaches and these days and as we all get, I'm sure, but if you've got someone in front of you and they only want to lose 10 pounds and you're now going, well, here we're going to work for the shortened range. Here we're going to work for the length of range. Here we're going to work through this. Here we're going for this. It's like the reality is for most coaches in the whole industry, the majority of your client base is lifestyle. Like they don't care. Keep it simple. It's about, it's about making it simple. Do you know what I mean? Like, and even for us, does it really matter? Do you know what I mean? Like, does it really, really matter? Like, does it... 10%-ish. I don't know if that, if anything, but it's just the little finer details. That's all it is. Like, you just see what you can like. For 1%, if it's going to be 1%, you've got to make sure that you're still, you're 99% on the rest of it to make that 1% worthwhile because... Like, I'm not a 1% bodybuilder. I'm not in the remotely chance I'm a 1% bodybuilder. I'm an 80% bodybuilder, and I will happily admit that. I will put on more body fat in the off-season and be a bit more lax with everything. I don't care about peri-workout nutrition. I just eat in the day. Like, these all... Like, I didn't eat until 3 o'clock, half 3. I went and trained upper. Like, I, I didn't eat. Like, it is what it is. I'm still bigger than most. Do you know what I mean? Like... It is I've I, and, and and I I come from like obviously mentoring off Josh and obviously you're coached by Josh so you completely understand as well. It's like he's a very chilled, laid back person. Like sometimes, don't get me wrong, I'd wash, want him to put some more of his opinions across, but he's very sort of like he's very Switzerland. Like when it comes to everything, like he doesn't die on any sort of one method or ideology or anything like that. Like whereas I'll there's certain things that I'm like, no, I don't agree with that or this things, or I don't agree with this or something like this. So having him as my sort of foundation, my mentor, he, he very much has kept me grounded over the years and being like, it's not that deep. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter that much. Like focus on what's in front of you. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day. And I think that's always something that's resonated with me. And I think so many more coaches could learn from that as well. 
Like it doesn't need to be that complex. Even competitive bodybuilding doesn't need to be that complex. You keep yourself stress-free. You keep it simple. You keep the body stress-free. You're going to get the best results in reality. But as long as you're consistent with things and you're ticking these boxes daily. I mean, even like you said, if you're 80%, you need to like in the off season you need to enjoy yourself you need to have a life i mean we spoke about this so many times on the podcast because you're just going to get burnt out if you like 100 percent all the time you're going to come to a stage think i fucking hate bodybuilding i'm not doing this anymore so you go from that fucking 100 percent to literally nothing so you need to have that own time and and that point you've just made there is 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 a big thing and I, and I see it more so on it in a negative term in for to bodybuilding and i feel like competitive bodybuilding gets this demonization of like people going oh i hate it because they've gone so in they've gone all in on it and it's completely absorbed their whole entire life and now they hate bodybuilding and they give it such a negative terminology and negative connotations and it's like the reality is you just weren't made out for it but but in any other sport you wouldn't be like that you'd be like oh football shit or rugby shit or whatever like you don't hear that as much as you hear it when you come to bodybuilding, competitive bodybuilding, people doing it. Like people aren't that deep on when on other sports, but when it comes to bodybuilding, it's just like because there's drugs involved, or even in the natty scenario, you're pushing to levels of condition where you're going hypogonadal. It's not great for your health. Do you know what I mean? That's fine, but it's an extreme sport. Like it's a very much extreme sport, and it's just like too many people give this up. Too many people then demonize it. And it's just like rather than just saying it just wasn't for me, like um, I think, like it's all or nothing again, though, isn't it? Like you see oh. it in every scenario. It's fucking if you're either all in or you're not doing it at all. And like people can't have that balance of like you you talking about you never ate till like three o'clock today. People are either like got their six pack fucking meal prep bags in the off season or they're not doing it at all. It's one or the other. And it's just if you if you're going to have that approach, you are going to eventually burn out. That's that's the problem. Massively, and it's like. I'll be 80% on it all year round. Like, it's like I did a post ages ago about it. It's like, if you don't want to turn up, just still turn up to the gym. Like, it's more just a case of just turning up when you don't want to. And even if you just went and did a session you wanted to do rather than what your session was planned out, that's eventually all of those half assed sessions that you think you're having eventually lead, oh, do you know what? I've made more progress on my physique again. But it's like what you just said there, Connor. It's as soon as they go to nothing. Yeah, well, you, you're never gonna you're never gonna achieve if you don't do anything, are you? Yeah, that's it. Like for me, recently with like um, opening up in the gym and everything, it's been like my training has not been a priority at all. So my sessions have been crammed in. Maybe if I get an hour in between clients or things like that, and I was thinking that to myself the other day. People are asking how the training's going, and I'm like, oh, it's fucking shite at the minute. But you know, I've still turning up, still ticking boxes, still doing the sessions, still making progress, and it's like. That's what it's all about, essentially. You could, it'd be so easy for me to throw in the towel and say, oh, I've not got time right now, but it's, it's not the truth. And if you did, if, if you were expecting perfection, you would give up in this scenario and that would get you nowhere. So, you know, rather than expect perfection, you want to be consistently good. Like the, uh, like the new CGM merch that's coming now. Progress over perfection, mate. Oh, that's class. Like Let's get merch out. That's fucking sick. When's that coming? Uh, this is just the finalised thing. I'm just, I'm taking that off the front because I've got it on the back. Um, and that's our little weight plate, little CGM mascot that says, hustle Hello. for the muscle, progress over perfection. That's class. Is it weird CGM. that I think it kind of looks like Josh? The little figure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel it's oh, okay. out here. I think I'm going to have to hire him. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> Become part of the team. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the saying that I repeatedly say to my clients that I've now copyrighted is progress over perfection. <laughs> and it's it more relevant to bodybuilding. Do you know what I mean? It couldn't be relevant to bodybuilding because you're never going to be perfect in bodybuilding. You're never going to achieve perfection in it. And it's just making progress that matters. And I think like it comes down to the world we live in. Everyone wants everything now. Everything want like Uber, Deliveroo, whatever. It's all Amazon. You don't have to leave your house and you can get everything delivered and everything's now. The reality is no matter how many drugs you take or whatever you do in bodybuilding, it's going to take what it takes. <laughs> But it's like when, when I get a new client and they, uh, they sign up, I always tell them, as long as we're 
making one step each week in the right direction. We don't have to be 100% from the start, especially the gen pop clients. They think, right, I've got to be 100% on this. I mean, we just need to like edge forward week by week. I mean, even if like the diet or the diet plan's not consistent or you're not cons- like sticking to it or everything's not like 100% straight away, as long as we're getting better each week at like being like consistent or adhering to that plan, then we're heading in the right direction. We're making progress. I think your um, your lifestyle clients are a bit more like that, though. Eh? They come in with this impression, like, right now, I'm really going to get on it. I've been really off the ball, and I'm really going to change things here. And it's like, well, just settle down. Let's just make a few small changes and see how that goes. Massively, mate, because they've like what you said earlier. They've come from a nothing, and now they're going to the all. And it's just like, whoa, let's let's meet halfway. Yeah. Let's build. Let's slowly build. Do you know what I mean? Because especially like the majority of obviously gen pop clients, like you say, JT, it's like they're coming for weight loss. Do you know what I mean? Nine times out of 10, they're coming for weight loss. Like we get the odd ones that are stayed longer and now we can move into a growth phase and now we can really start making some things. But the reality is most of our job is weight loss and you've got to get through to them that it it didn't take four months for them to put it on. It it was probably the best part of a good couple of years of building up. Do you know what I mean? Um, So they've got to realize that yeah, we can pull off a lot in like four or five months, for example. But are you going to be comfortable with that pace of pulling off at four or five months? Because essentially it's like at four or five month pace, especially if they've got a lot to lose, you're sort of, you're treating it like a prep, aren't you, at the end of the day, but without the focus of, I want to compete. Like they're just lifestyle clients wanting to lose weight. So it's like, they don't actually have that end goal in mind because it's not an end goal. It's sort of like a, a moving scale. So it's like you can be like to them go, well, we can approach it. We can get results over across a year and you can have flexibility with socials on the weekend, a holiday here and there. But the reality is if you want to make progress in four or five months, a good amount of progress, you're going to have to sacrifice those social events and give your all to those four months. And I think that's where getting those gen pop clients on board and getting that understanding is like, you may have wanted to blitz this, but we're trying to do something more last last long that you can sustain. And then if you, when you sustain that, going right, you're having a social event, but we're still staying in a deficit in the week, just the socials on the weekend, pop things this, and then they keep that. They're like, then they realize that they can sustain this method of living, and they've changed their habits rather than being like, I've just given it all for four months. I didn't actually take any learnings from that. I didn't give it chance. I was just going fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, and then they go. Oh, now back to what I was normally. And it's just like, whereas if you, once you get them on board for longer and sustain it out, they t- tend to sustain it longer afterwards, I find anyway. But even then, if you, um, if say you do give it the four or five months where you absolutely blitz it and you go all in, it's how you come out of that then. It's how you reverse out of that and like teach them how to maintain what they've achieved. Because if you can do that, then it's fine. But the problem I find a lot of the time is a lot of clients that I get, they have actually lost weight before or they've lost the fat before and they've put it back on and no one there's not a lot of coaches that talk about getting in shape and then figuring out how to actually maintain it and like I think for me it's something that makes a huge difference like I, I don't ever want like a, a gym pop kind of fat loss client coming back and saying I've regained it all again and you know that's that's like a, a total failure in my eyes so it's like we have to reverse them out of it and then teach like if it, if it has been more like as you say a kind of blitz sort of thing it, it, we then need to reverse them out of it properly and healthily and teach them how they can maintain it while still doing their stuff at the weekends or enjoying the foods that they want to enjoy and just giving them that sustainable lifestyle where they can keep themselves in great shape i think it's been I mean, clear it's like being clear from the beginning setting the expectations and like laying out that time <laughs> frame, saying what you need to do bit by bit so we're going to go into this phase, then we're going to go into a fat loss phase, and then we're going to go into like a health maintenance phase and then see what we can do from there. Then we can go into a gaining phase. So tell them how you're laying it out and what their journey is going to look like. And that's when they're going to stay with you for the longest, longest because they don't know what they're going to do and they know what the goal is at the time. Because most people think, right, photo shoot, prep, fat loss or whatever it is, that's the end goal. But there's more to it, like what's next, what's next. And then there's another fat loss phase and then we can look better each time and keep going like that. But it's just setting those expectations from the beginning and then what you need to do or how drastic that fat loss needs to be. And so on was like, what you need to do to get to like X, Y, Z or how drastic you need to be say, all right, I need to get in shape for this photo shoot in eight weeks. I'm like, fucking hell, right. We need, we can't have any social occasions. We can't know off plan meals. We need to be really, really strict. 
or I've got this like wedding in like 20 weeks and I'm starting off on a relatively like decent spot. I say, okay, we can still do this, can still do that, but maybe tidy up in the week and still have those social occasions at the weekend. It just depends like what's the time frame, what's the goal, who's the person, all that sort of shit. But I had a client who came to me and um, she was on like 1200 calories. And it was like, right, we fucking definitely can't start there because she's been on them for like the last like four months. And it was like, what do you want to achieve out of this? We're like, oh, more weight loss. I was like, we've got nowhere to work with. Like, I want to go into like some sort of like priming phase to start off with, like four to six weeks. I'm going to bump your calories up nice and slowly. So we started off on like 1800. And each week she's like maintained weight where she was. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I threw another like 200 calories in bit by bit. So we're on like two, three now. And she's still like holding that weight where she was when we very first started. We're like, all right, buzzing. So we'll go into like a fat loss phase in a couple of weeks because our calories are quite high. Our output's like relatively low. So we've got like quite a lot to work with now. But initially, she didn't quite understand that stage of, right, we need to get everything in place in terms of like habits, um, the output, health markers, all that sort of shit first before we actually go into this fat loss phase because we're not primed for that fat loss phase. We'll end up on like fucking 500 calories to start getting it off. So it'd be fucking, obviously that's ridiculous. We can't do that, but... It's just making it's sure of that phase just, first. Just shows how much of a state her body was in. Then, if you can take it from fucking twelve hundred cows and taking it up to twenty three hundred, and not really much change. Do you know what I mean? It just screams that the body was wanting a break. Do you know what I mean? Wanting, needing that rest and needing that pullback is like, it's like Josh is like. Obviously, I've been dieting now two weeks. Yeah, two weeks, just over two weeks. Yeah, and I'm nearly seven kilos down in two weeks, and. All we did was, but that's that's why you didn't eat till free today. Eh? You're delayed. I fast. I fast every day, mate. I fast every day. Um, Good so technique I, in a diet, though. To be fair, and then you shove all your food to the, the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I tend to just eat it across like three meals, um, and I've always struggled with food focus. I've always struggled being an emotional eater. I've always struggled with binging. I've always struggled with this over the years. It's taken me years and years. That's another reason like where where I think I, I add quite a lot of value with coaching and, and with especially for Josh and stuff like this, because Josh has Josh doesn't eat. Josh doesn't have anything emotional when it comes to food. Josh just can do this. So I feel like I have more of an understanding with the clients that suffer with that and have more approaches to put in place for stuff like that. And it's like, and that's been always one of my things is like, if I can fast for midday, when I was in the off season and four and a half thousand calories, I'd still fast till midday and then just spread across, across four meals from that point. And it suited me better. I've got numerous amount of clients that suit their lifestyle better and they can control their eating habits in that way. And it's like, I feel like sometimes, especially with bodybuilding, it's like, Oh no, you need to eat every two and a half hours. You need to do this. You need to do this. And sometimes that just adds too much stress to people's lives mm -hmm. and too much problem to people's lives. And it's like, so I've, that's why I, so that's why I've always sort of pushed my calories back because it's allowed me to feel more in control. And I think that's a big thing when it obviously people's food, but anyway, back to, I digress anyway, but back to my diet, it's like, cause we'd stuck at three, two for so long for my off season because we the different approach we did for this year because I was trying to make weight for classic coming in the coming year whereas I was just in bodybuilding last year is that we just ramped drugs up and kept food the same so as soon as and so I recomped and sort of grew within that and then so as soon as we made a cut to the calories we went from three two down to two two so we cut a thousand calories straight off and so my body was just like instantly responsive up steps and then obviously adding some fat burners in like planning your himbine. But I think um, <laughs> that always He's helps. Natty, he? no, that's his reaction to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, your himbine in the natty world is always a weird one, I think. Like, I've never tried it. Yeah. It, I can't it's, great. It. It's, it's great for uh, giving yourself an extra bit of wood, that's for sure. That's that's I definitely find that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's originally what it was designed for, wasn't it? That was what it was designed for. Yeah, it gives me uh, gives me really bad headaches. Literally the same thing that Viagra does. So it makes me I feel like it's going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped taking it because I took it for three consecutive days. I was like, why am I getting really bad headaches? But she him by and so I pulled that out it was totally fine and just up the clen. Josh, Josh had the same thing when he started prep and he went. If you want to start on this? I went, mate, shut up. 
I said, I'm taking it. I'm just bashing it straight in. I was like, but to be honest, I was taking it. I was taking it for the majority of my off season. I was trialing. Uh, um, I was trying the method alongside, obviously, trying to improve body composition. I was like the method of well, I can't take Clem because Clem carries on burning throughout the throughout the day. But the fact that I fast until midday or the late afternoon, I was like, can I capitalize on more fat loss whilst building by utilizing the himbine up until I eat and then eating my rest of my calories, putting me in a surplus, but by being in that fasted state to start with whilst utilizing the himbine to see whether I would help bring body fat down and improve body composition while still growing at the same time without impacting my sort of surplus calories. That's interesting. So that was something that I trialed uh, this year, um, just to see just to see how it would go on. And I was pushing that up until like four weeks before we started dieting. And then I just came off the in mind, giving myself body a break. And then before I was reintroducing it back in, um, just as a trial of way of how to improve body composition whilst using drugs and things like that. That's why we also ran the drugs up and just kept food at the same. You still doing protocol with um, the EQ? Yeah, so um, so still on EQ at the moment. So still doing. Um, so my my gear is the highest it's ever been. Um, so I'm doing 990 milligrams, or basically a thousand milligrams of test, and 720 milligrams of EQ. Um, and obviously, like I was speaking to you, JT, wasn't it? When I was, we were uh, training a couple of weeks back. Obviously, everyone demonizes EQ because of obviously increased sort of blood cell hematocrit, everything like that, blood pressure, and all from that side of things. Um, so it's always been like a demonized product, especially I think obviously like literature and everything like that as well. Obviously, it's more sort of horse use and things like this is like. Um, but I speak to so many people that rave about it. And um, and me as a coach, I'm very much a let's experiment on me. Do you know what I mean? Let's see how it affects me. Let's see, like, I'm all for experimenting. I'm all for drug you trialing and everything like this. Like, this is another reason. Like with Josh, is like I'm always like, well, what about this? What about this? And he's a bit just like, oh, well, I don't really see the point. And so I'm like, yeah, but fuck it, let's just just trial it. Do you know what I mean? Let's, let's get inventive. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, it's like even like when it comes to like landness, like because I was using growth hormone. I was like, well, can we just even just put 10 IU Atlantis in, even though my food doesn't really necessarily warrant it because of the extra IGF response with having things like this. And Josh is like, uh, yeah, but it's probably just minor. It's not even fucking worth doing. But I'm just like, oh, just then I'm like, this is where I get sciencey and I'm an experiment. And I'm just like, yeah, but let's 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 see what happens. Shall we? Like, if it does make a difference and things like that. But so what is EQ? Equipoids. Or boldenone, as it's. I've heard, I've heard, well. of, I've heard of that boldenone. Yeah, I don't know if I've heard and, you talking about it, but I've heard someone talking. Uh, it's not been like clinically used in humans, as in like any studies. It's only been in like vegetarian like models and stuff like horses and rats, but it's it's been used in bodybuilding for a long time. But yeah, everyone's sort of always demonised it because obviously everyone's on the master on primo hype. Um, which is, I mean, obviously, of course, great literature backs it up and everything like this. But like one of my friends, Deck, shout out Deck, and who does the other podcast with Riz and all that lot and Hilly and things like that, whether you've seen their uh, whatever, I can't even remember what their podcast is called. But Deck is massively science based and massively blood work with all his clients, everything like this. And he's a big fan of EQ and he has numerous amount of case studies of people's blood work and he's just not seeing the things that people have said over the years. And it's like, I ran drugs higher than I ever have been before and my blood work's come back glowing than it ever has before. And it, that was one of the biggest eye openers for me. And also one of the main things as well, what I'm seeing a real good thing with EQ is the controlling of estrogen um is seems to be great um like i'm running a grammar test and my e my estrogen is still in range um so like my test is coming out at like 360 nanomole and my estrogen was like 83 like still within range now obviously sometimes that can be concerning because you'd be like you'd want your estrogen higher to go up with your test you know what i mean because obviously we don't want to crush estrogen because you need the estrogen to grow you need estrogen for everything but i feel great so it's like that 
I, I can only go off my anecdotal evidence. It's like, I feel great. I've been able to push my test higher than ever before, which is then being able to allow my physique to be a lot fuller. My weaker areas like my chest that I've always struggled to grow are now growing and staying fuller. Um, this, like say for example, if I was comparing it to prep, I'm still using the sort of basically all the same drugs in this pre-dieting phase before prep as I was in prep. But like my libido dropped off within like four weeks of prep last year. Like I feel fucking great. I've dropped seven kilos in two weeks and I'm probably leaner than I was for the best half of all of last prep. And I, and I feel great. Training performance is continuously going up. Like... And everything's being managed one. But the main thing, which is also ties into something that JT was going on about lately. I also think it's, it's allowed because of the estrogen controlling being so well, it's also allowed my progesterone, uh, my progesterone, my prolactin to come down massively. Um, because that is something that I've always struggled being quite high. Um, and reasons why I can't take DECA or too much train and things like this. My dick just stops working and, then the missus gets fuming. <laughs> um, <laughs> even though like my prolactin come back ridiculously high, I've had no like symptoms of it, which is like yeah, weird. Because it, it's like even when I was running uh the sports TRT, do you know what I mean at like 200 odd or whatever it was, testosterone, my prolactin was still at like 300. Like, and I don't get me wrong, I've been taking obviously the P5B vitamin. But it's gone from literally like 300 to like 185. Okay. And I've had the most productive off season that I've ever have, having my test much higher because I've also obviously done all the years of following the safer model use that obviously got put out in the industry in terms of like running your test up to 300 and then obviously running your DHT derivatives higher and things like this. But it, honestly, I think my body always fell off at about after about 10 weeks and just wanted to just crumble. And I think it was just because obviously... I was never allowing my test to go higher. And I think obviously, especially within the industry, there's always a bit of ooh around how high your test should go. Um, because obviously everything that Victor Black's put out and things like that. But then you watch Victor Black's stuff on his websites and his and his literature, and he sort of tells you a slightly different message to what he necessarily used to rant about on on like Instagram, for example, is that he is still also a believer that your test should go as high as as high as you can get it without side effects, essentially. Yeah, and I think John says, I think that, yeah, and I think that's one area that we're we're not picking up on, and we're still keeping that at three hundred, but then we're smashing like a gram of mast, and it's like. Well, if you're doing 300 tests and a gram of mast, don't get me wrong, that's going to work for some people. Like one of my clients, a guy called Dan, uh, sort of African black heritage, and it's like he he grows well, you think, but he was way more sensitive to having more tests. Do you know what I mean? So he worked better on having that that other ratio higher. Whereas I think like I think most people would probably end up dealing with feeling better on a higher on a higher test ratio but i think it's one thing in the industry that we're so ooh taboo about um but everyone's scared of estrogen but you need it fucking hell and everyone's like blasting like ais and serms and like it's brain help as well so if you don't have a certain amount of estrogen it's like neuroprotective oh, yeah. especially if you're smashing oh, things yeah. like trend, like nandrolone then that's going to be fucking really, really um, bad for your brain and all the neurons and things. You, you know, I should probably just like get on a course of steroids just to learn about the shit. <laughs> no, it's it is a, it's a very interesting world, and like especially if you're a bit science based, you can be like, oh, we just like, but it definitely isn't the. It definitely isn't the miracle drug that obviously everyone sort of makes makes out that it is. Or I suppose if you're in the industry, you know it's not a miracle drug, but especially you still need to do the work. It just allows you to recover better at the end of the day and be able to perform a bit better. Do you know what I mean? That is the plain and simple of it. You recover quicker and you can perform a bit better, but the work still has to be done. You um, still, again, it goes back to what we are talking about before. You've still got to tick all those boxes. Still got to do all the, the, the daily shit that you've got to do. 100%, mate, 100%. Um, but yeah, the, but the prolactin coming down and my blood work being lovely... I was like, well, well shot by that. Um, and I can only go on how I feel and how everything's performing and it's going better than ever. 
but I know obviously JT, you were talking about the prolactin being so high, you're high, but like you say, you didn't feel didn't feel any sort of negative symptoms from that high prolactin. That's it. So I actually like had to trace it back because I had my blood from 12 weeks before I had these. And I was like, what have I done different in 12 weeks? Because I was on prep like 12 weeks ago and I was taking things like Tren and everything. And like it was, it was, it was all taking Tren. So I thought, what have, what have I done differently? And I pinpointed it. I was like, it's vaping. That's the only fucking thing that I've been doing differently. And I looked into it in terms of like the studies on vaping so far and nicotine. And that can like really, really increase your prolactin levels. So I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to have to fucking knock this on the head. So I've not stopped completely because I've sort of got a bit of a habit to it or an addiction. Well, like that, addiction. But... Not a habit, mate. You've got addiction. You're in a safe space. We, me and Connor have got <laughs> Yeah, and the I rest of everyone is going to this on YouTube or fucking Spotify or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm gradually tapering it down. So bit by bit, I'm coming off it. So I've gone from the disposables to the refill, and then I'm just gradually, I'm not taking it out with me anymore. So if I go to the gym or I'm going to walk or anything, not doing that. But if I'm sat at home doing check-ins or content or anything, it's just on the side. And sometimes I can literally just bl blitz it and fucking do it so much. Did you did you find when with the vape? Because I actually put a story about this not long ago up on my um, Insta story a couple of weeks back. Because I was saying, like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get the vaping thing. You start because you started prep and oh no, nicotine reduces appetite. Right. It's never going to reduce your appetite that much. You're still going to be hungry as fuck, no matter what yeah. you fucking do. You didn't reduce my appetite. No, exactly. But now you've got an addiction instead. So. <laughs> So you, you, you gained. You, you know what uh, you else reduces enough. your appetite is uh, heroin. Yeah, yeah that's and <laughs> great for weight loss as well. Great. For weight loss. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I was like, I don't get it. Going around puffing this thing and everything like this, but like, because I was, more I was thinking about it, I was just like, it just doesn't make sense in terms of like what in comparison to what everyone bangs on about in the industry. Do you know what I mean? Everyone bangs on about being 1%. Everyone bangs on about this. Everyone bangs on about recovery. Everyone this. Guess what vaping doesn't do? Allow you to recover. Like, you are constantly pumping in a stimulant. It's like, we go on about caffeine after half two. How many of you are smoking your nicotine after half two? Do you know what I mean? That is a stimulus. That is a drug. Like, you say about, you tell no caffeine, you say these things, but you're putting stimulants in you in other way, shape or form. So it's like, I understand obviously when we're in prep, we've got, we've got other drugs in and especially up, apart from obviously the, the natty guys, more respect to you, mate, more respect. <laughs> um, but we've got things in there to obviously like help with things and stuff like this. And I know obviously they, they affect things, but like the vape is just so easily there. We're on it, we're token on it all the time. And it's just stimulant, 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 stimulant. And I was like, one of my clients, Steve, he is massively science-based, PT himself, like he's trying a method and stuff at the moment with me, whilst being under me. And I was like, mate, why, why is your why why can you only do handle like four weeks of training and your body like wants to fall off? And then it was like he stopped vaping and his recovery capability went through the fucking roof. And I was like, imagine that that is having such an effect on your training sessions and burning your CNS out to the point that you can only go for four weeks, but without having to take a deload. And then he went cold turkey on that. And his training has just gone through the roof. I was just like, I didn't even believe that it would have made that much difference. But when you actually, like like you say, you look into it, you research into it, what is it? What's it doing? It's like, well, it makes perfectly sense then, isn't it? If you're just smashing stimulants, like you're burning your CNS out. And I was just like, and then I was just like, it's so contradictory to what everyone's saying in the ind in the industry with what we sort of say and everything. As they're saying it, put token on, obviously, the mini penis in their mouth. Um the, the, the story of this podcast is don't worry about whether you're working the fucking lengthened range or the shortened range. Just give up vaping and then sort yourself out from there. <laughs> exactly. Don't, don't it is stop. fucking mental. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not just like in terms of the effects in prolactin. It can affect like shit in your brain as well because 
you, you're not just smoking the nicotine, it's all the other fucking toxins that you're taking in with it. They've got to cross like the blood brain barrier and it's going to affect the fucking neurons as well. So that's been some well, of the stuff that's come back in it. So I'm like, fuck. So there's trend, nandrolone, and fucking vaping that's going to fuck your brain up that you take on prep. But um, well, why especially... did you start it, James, more than anything? Because, like, remember when, when you first started it, I sent you a video, like, Sophie had one in the car, and I took a wee puff of it and that, and I was on prep at the time too. And I was like, oh, that's nice. It's a wee taste in your mouth, isn't it? Just to, like, Just, give yeah. you something. But um, I and it never really took off for me, but for you it definitely did. But... Um, I'm a, I'm a drug, drug addict, so... <laughs> <laughs> what um what it was i like the feeling of it when i first did it because i did it on my first show so i was competing it was that warm-up show i ever did at, um gpo gbo or whatever it was fucking some shit federation so <laughs> another fed not <laughs> it was shit um a band um, <laughs> so- i called a peter <laughs> i'll tag a minute as well uh, so yeah i went to the shop near there and I thought, I'm just going to get a vape because everyone was fucking vaping at the venue. And I thought, I'll get one of these sort of like. So, drag back again. It was like, oh, fucking hell, what was that? You know, the Nicky Rush. I was like, yeah. I feel all right. Like, That's cool. So, anyway, started blasting it. But, and then I did did it, let's just 600 puff. Then, after the show, I was like, I'm going to get another one of them. Anyway, started doing that. And then, after about a week or so, I wasn't getting that Nicky Rush no more, but I still felt like I needed to do it. And here we go. Well, here we am. <laughs> Yeah, and it just has to keep ramping up, doesn't it? I think like with like I've got no issue jogging with people vaping and things like this. Do whatever you want. Like I smoke weed on a daily basis. That is my outlet. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't really my life's much better with it. Do you know what I mean? I'm scott awful with sleep. Like I've always struggled with sleep, insomnia, everything like this. So weed's been a game changer in my life. So I'm always we all have our things that we enjoy, do you know what I mean? Whether it's a drink or smoke or whatever and things like this. The only thing that I can't get on board with, which actually I was actually having a conversation with Joe Ballinger in the gym the other day because I was I was taking the piss out of him because he went on his social media a good few months ago. It's like I'm quitting, there's there, this. And then he's just there token on it. I was just like, I thought you meant to be quitting. And he's like, Do you know what, Josh? I don't fucking want to quit. He's like, it's it's the one fucking outlet that I fucking have nowadays. He's like, I stopped doing all the extras, I stopped going out, I stopped doing this. He's like, that's my that's my sort of outlet. My that's my bad thing. And he's like, and I do you know what? And I was like, mate, I've got more time for you being like that rather than going, I'm taking it to uh curb my appetite or this and it's just like or just to taste rainbows in my mouth, like and it's just like when it comes to the bodybuilder, I'm just like, that's fine. That, I'm, I can be on board with that with that rationale. But when people try to say like it's for bodybuilding, I'm just like, it's not though, is it? Because like what you what you said there about the neurons and everything like that, it's like it's raising your prolactin, but a good healthy level of so not only is that affecting your neurons and everything like that, but that's also a job of prolactin. Like, so when prolactin's in a healthy range, that is what your prolactin is helping. It's helping with neurogenesis. It's helping with spermogenesis. It's helping with anti-stress, anti-anxiety. So it's like you fuck your prolactin and then you also then get the damage of the nicotine taking it further past that point as well. So it's just like, I'm just like, can't win. Makes can't the, main, win. It's the main reason like, why well, I do it as well because I'm a very like anxious person in general and over prep, it just seemed to amplify it, especially if you're taking compounds like Trent. And when I started Probably vaping, too. I felt a lot less anxious. It was again, like it was like a relief sort of, so especially on show day, we're fucking absolutely blitzing them. And it, it, it did help with that. So I think that's why I sort of found... Um, is it a dopamine release you get as well from it? Probably, yeah. With, with the nicotine. Yeah, you would have uh, Yeah, nicotine stimulates the release of chemical dopamine in the brain. So it's it's that basically that's, how, that's doing it. So, so does heroin again. Exactly. <laughs> and keep coming Scotsman. back to that. <laughs> <laughs> train spotting. Oh, train spotting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we've talked about this before as well, James. I don't think this is the first time this came up. I say it all the time, train spotting, because it's just Scotland, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah that's about. When you say Scotland, I just think train spotting. See, at English shows, you're all backstage, you know, vaping. We're all backstage, like, hitting up with heroin and that. Lines of coke and that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Everyone's got their key out. <laughs> <laughs> Quick bump. <laughs> to be fair, I don't know if they're banned in that. Eh? Um, uh, what you call it, federations? Like, they might be banned in comp, but obviously not banned out of comp. <laughs> yeah. Not that I've checked. <laughs> We've never had any reason to check. Head, head shaven, so you can't take any hair follicles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Certainly not helping the performance anyway, although maybe pre workout it would give you a bit of a boost. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've, 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 I've heard a few people doing that as pre workout, that's for sure. <laughs> I've went so downhill now, man. I'm like a fucking old man. Like, I, even nowadays, I'm like, don't know if I want to take a pre workout. Hey, eh? don't want to be, don't want to be jittering later, later in the day or anything. <laughs> they honestly, they honestly do nothing to me. Honestly, it's weird. Like, like I, the gym that I train at is the guy that owns Alpha Neon Supplements. So, like, he's like got some great products and stuff like this. But it's like I've never found any effect on like i seem to have a very good drug tolerance and so it's like pump products don't even don't even know that they're in my system um like mv pre i took of some of my mates i barely even felt anything like so i just i've never bothered with pre-workouts or pumps or anything like i've just never ever felt the need for them or a benefit from them or anything or even just feeling them I, I think it's a bit like James's fucking vaping habit. It's like you get used to having like a drink before you train and that's it. Like it could be fucking diluting juice for all that matters. It's like, it's just that like ritual. That's the Scottish, you know, term. That's the Scottish term right there. Diluting <laughs> juice. <laughs> Squash. Diluting sorry. Juice. What the fuck's that? <laughs> Squash. 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 Cordial. Yeah. Or cordial, yeah. Cordial. Squash or cordial. Diluting juice. Cordial, come on. Who calls it oh, cordial? Don't, don't get started on fucking, what are they, potato fucking scones? And tatty scones. Yeah. <laughs> tatty scones. Yeah. Potato game. Potato game. Yeah. Potato game. <laughs> I need to get more That's Scottish not, people on this fucking no. podcast. Potato cakes northern. Potato cakes northern. <laughs> I, I thought um, they were a Scottish thing, to be fair. Oh, mate. I, Scotland's, um, I want to, venture up more to Scotland for sure I've only <laughs> done uh, Stirling and Glasgow well I'm, I'm near Stirling so you can come to the new physique factory gym oh, I'll have to come check it out for sure <laughs> pressure's on see when people say they're coming to see the gym I'm like fuck I'm like they're going to be just- yeah. <laughs> 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 better get some more I was only <laughs> <laughs> there's a few guys so the, the, the gym that I train at through in Perth usually is like it's a, it's a solid gym like we've got some lovely pieces and then there's a few guys from there like coming through on Sunday and they're like yeah we're going to come train Jess and I'm like fuck like you're going to be so disappointed like I've not got half the stuff they've got there it's just like it's just a small gym like but it's it's great it's like- Cable press is great. Cable press is yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I have to show them how to do it. <laughs> they've never had to do it in their life. They've got all these nice chest presses, and they're like, now they're using cables that they've got in the gym at home. <laughs> I was saying it's JT. I said I've been doing all of my chest workouts on cables, and I felt they're better than they ever have. <laughs> to be fair, obviously, cable chest press is fucking JT great. Broke, JT broke it down for me to say that obviously nothing was any different from a mechanical resistance. Oh, program, oh. <laughs> you get a nerdy with shit. I, I, I do, was like, I do like the cable chest press. To be fair, though, because like it does like is 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 maybe a bit like you know, like this Cybex VR two press, James. Oh, we converging one. Yeah, it's a bit like that. How it's hard as fuck at the end, and you are getting that burn right into that short. Oh. Like, yeah, it, fact, it's nice. I um, we've got an old school life fitness chest press that I use as a cable fly and a sternal press. But one of the my favourites has always been a clavicular incline press, cable press. Yeah, yeah, uh, they're very good. Love that for chest. I, I can't say yeah. I've done any other like incline movement where I actually feel my upper pec as much as that. If you've got it set up right, and, and like again, a lot of people will look at you and be like, "What the fuck are they doing in the cables?" And like people still don't get it. But honestly, once you try it and you actually feel your upper pec for the first time, you're like, holy shit, like, incline bench does nothing for my upper pec, it's a fucking front delt exercise. Oh, yeah, no. That's the incline cable sack press, unbelievable. Well, I, I'm like, you know, like I was saying earlier about, um, there's not a lot of, obviously, coming from Josh, there's not, try and stay Switzerland, I don't die. One thing I die hard on is pronated pressing. I die hard on that needs to be eradicated when it comes to chest. Because in my eyes, it's just not, 
it's more you're getting more dealt than I'd ever want in there and a semi-pro neutral press and a, being able to converge with that in my eyes is just far superior than any sort of pro that you're pressing for chest and even for for delts because in my eyes you're pressing against your body's anatomical alignment like where does your arms naturally sit if you just drop your arms down by your side where do they naturally sit they sit in semi-pronated so as far as i'm concerned pressing should all stay within that it's just having that freedom and that like you know having equipment where you you have the choice where you're not fixed in a position especially like those those end ranges for people you know where you've actually got a choice to go into a position that is going to be more like suited to you because Again, we're all going to be a bit more internally or more externally rotated at the shoulder, so where you kind of naturally sit is going to differ. So, but as you say, for most people, this is fucking shit. This is shit. It's also like if you break down what is probably some of the biggest injuries and niggles that people get, it's probably their shoulders. Yeah. Because the reality is they're building. Because obviously, what's the standard? This is the shoulder press, isn't it? This is the standard shoulder press. Yeah, yeah. And this, this is my full range of motion. It's not, though, is it? it? It's not, because you're in a pronated thing. Whereas if you do that, you can, you, that moves more freely down. So my rationale is that the reason we're getting shoulder niggles is, well, one, our shoulder joint is so vital for everything to be able to move freely in all positions and everything like this, that if you're building muscle, in a shortened range of motion over time and you're building muscle onto that, then that shoulder is now not working through full range of motion, but you're building tissue on it. So you're also reducing that range of motion that they can do with more muscle mass. And then, then that's when the niggles start coming because that shoulder has been built into a line that isn't now moving freely because it's never worked through its full range of motion whilst you're building that tissue. Again, it's, it's that end range as well, isn't it? Is shoulder pressing, say if you're going into that externally rotated position, most people, most people I've worked with and seen, they don't have the range to get into that that position from pressing in that position because they literally don't have that external rotation. So they end up having to press something like this, where the rib cage is really flared, and then external rotation at the shoulder, maybe a little bit of internal rotation if you're doing like a, a flat press. So they go into abduction, then internal rotation, which is a bit of a shit position for your shoulder to be in. But yeah, it's um Abduction with any like excessive internal external rotations, probably not like the it's, best. It's trying to tell people that though, because you say shoulder press, they want to go out here, they're like, Oh yeah, that's a shoulder press, but it's like, so is this. This is also a fucking shoulder press. If if I don't delves on top of that, it's obviously when people I, I, I go out complaining that and I actually had people message me afterwards going, Oh my god, this is so much better. They were like, Don't get me wrong, I was initially slightly weaker, obviously getting used to the movement. They were like, once I got used to the movement progressions went higher like my strength went for because you're in a more stable base do you know what i mean you're more it's more comfortable it's more stable it's more controlled like like what jt said if they're not strong doing this it, it's already weaker but you're putting yourself into an already weaker position what, what about so like, shoulder pressing anyway do you guys do a lot of like front delt presses because i know personally i don't really do many. i don't, I don't oh. shoulder press at all I don't shoulder press one bit. I only use lateral raises because I'm doubt dominant. So, yeah, that, I mean, you got to be, when you're doing a lot of chest press, your doubt's going to have to work to some degree anyway. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, whoever, we, whoever lacked anterior doubts, like, do you know what I mean? Can anyone name me one person that's ever lacked anterior doubts? Because I'm also a big believer in that we can get rid of a front raise and just fuck that off out of the exercise. Oh, yeah. Because... We've uh, we've made posts on that before, haven't we? Yeah, definitely. Avid believers that front raises can fuck right off. <laughs> but um, nah, I'm the saying, like, I, I don't tend to shoulder press very often. And even if I do, it will be this kind of neutral grip. It'll be like, it'll almost be like an incline press. That's, that's basically what it fucking is, it's an incline press. That's why, I, that's why I love the Atlantis incline chest and I love yeah. the Atlantis incline shoulder, uh, the shoulder press, sorry, because of those hand positions of what it has available to you. And the side um, Cybex is the same because you can go there. It's so good. The, the, the Atlantis and the Cybex, they're so good. The best shoulder presses out there. Not less Honestly. Ones good as well, to be fair. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got, we got the Nautilus one on the way to um, Alpha at the moment. Um, but we've also got the Nautilus chest press, the pin-loaded one, the old, yeah. old, old school. 
and mate, that just I'm I'm stacking the whole thing, and I don't want to put a pin in it because I don't want to fuck the machine. But so I just keep repping more reps on there. I'm like, dude, that is a problem. They are late, aren't they? With a knife, yeah. But to be honest, I think like that's where I'm like it forces me to push some more volume and stuff like this, and I think that's also been beneficial. Like trying to now push more volume in, into this because I think like once you get to a certain level of strength, you you do want to switch over to try and push more volume into that thing. So I think like if you stick stuck in on like eight to 12, six to tens and things like this, like even when you're massive and you're strong, you're gonna, well, that was one thing. It's like my strength and the risk to reward for training just wasn't coming back. Do you know what I mean? Like I've got to put more weight on there, more weight on there, more weight on there. And I'm like, Jesus, I don't want to fucking put the plates on, never mind fucking lift it and then get the risk of injury and things like this. So like, since I've been sort of pushing more 10 to 15, sort of 15 to 20s on certain exercises and stuff like that, it's been it's been massively beneficial, I feel. It's even just changing that's your tempo as well. Just fucking slowing yeah, exactly. down. Exactly. So it's that stimulus like fatigue ratio as well. I mean, we're constantly doing those six to tens, five to nines. Our CNS is going to be fucking burnt out from lifting that much load. I and mean, there's no way we can ca- like keep carrying on doing that. I've even found it of like squatting. I can't squat anymore because I can't. I can't get out of a squat what I need to in my legs without my CNS going into the floor. Like I can't get the stimulus in my legs from a, a, a Smith, I, Smith squat more than I obviously ever, I obviously I, I smashed the back end out of back barbell squatting obviously over lockdown as, as I'm sure everyone did. Um, that I vowed never to touch barbell ever again after that fucking, with the amount of forearm and tendonitis <laughs> and everything I had. Um, I vowed never to touch a barbell ever again. Um, and and obviously me as well being injury in riddled with injuries over the years, dislocated elbow, two ACL reconstructions, missing my hamstring from one of the ACL reconstructions, um, broken wrists, everything like this, like from all my rugby days. This is where like, I'm a big fan of machines. I'm a big fan of cables. I'm a big fan of all these things that go better lined up for my body, keep my injury low, keep my cns in a good position so i can actually recover and i think like it's one thing that obviously we always get asked i'm sure what's better free weights or machines and i i always say obviously the literature says no different but the biggest take home for me is injury like we're all just tools at the end of the day aren't they and they all have the place they all have the job it just depends yeah but if something's injuring you get it to fuck because you can't train if you're injured can you so yeah. yeah, but this is why I don't. This is why I never get why everyone bangs on about the fucking Cybex hack squat. Oh, the OG Cybex hack squat, but it's shearing my knees off, and they all admit it's shearing their knees off, and their knees are in crippled, and they're putting ice on their knees. Who, who's the guy that done like nine plates aside on that? I seen that the other day. Mate, there's a guy called Will Odom that's down by me, and honestly, we've got the original Cybex hacker grow room, and he would put every single twenty five plate on there. And just he would have to do AMRAPs on it, like because he was that strong. But it was just like I wouldn't even get anywhere close to putting that on. And I'd be like, oh, my knees are my knees want to snap. And I think when it comes to bodybuilding, then your knees out of or the whole of your body, your knees is the one thing you need to protect the most. Because if you want to be long, have longevity in this sport, if you even look at the pros, what's the first thing that goes on them? It's their legs. Do you know what I mean? Because they can't sustain the way that they were training, battering the fuck out of their knees and stuff like that. As soon as your knees go, you, you're fucked. Do you know what I mean? Like, in the grand scheme of things. It's interesting what um, you said about that Cybex hack, actually, because, like, having used it a couple of times, I kind of thought that too. I was like, what's the big deal here? Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, even if you reverse band it, it's still shearing my knees off. So I'm just like, I, I, I it, it's never, it's one thing that when everyone goes bangs on about it, I'm like, why? Like maybe because I've had two ACL reconstructions and my left knee's fucked that I'm more con- cautious and concerned about my knees and longevity. But it, it's never, I'm like, I'd rather do a leg press. I've always fucking got on way better with leg presses. I mean, lately my leg presses have gone to shit because I got, it was in a car accident a couple of months ago and the guy hit me from the left and the whole left side of my body is like now not working properly. It's tight as fuck. So my left hip's not open. I think I was telling you, JT, at the gym, my left hip's not opening up properly now, which then means that when I'm coming down on the leg press, my left hip's not opening up as much. So I keep pulling my adductor on the left side because it's not allowing that to move where it needs to move. 
So that's really made me have to get inventive with all my leg training now because I can't leg press, which is one of my main things. The squatting doesn't give me, um, the squatting seems to cause more knee pain as well as of late, but also burying my CNS more than I'm actually getting out my quad stimulus. So like I'm doing like single leg reverse lunges, single leg Smith split squats, and then like adductors, leg extensions and, and the rest of my work because I can't just, and I can't put the load through it anymore. Like, and I can't get my hip open to be able to do the leg press. So like, I've really had to get inventive with really keep progressing my leg training um, without doing the, the standard stuff. Do you know what I mean? Without doing the Even standard. Even if you go like single leg on the leg press, can you, can you work in hang around that or you're just not getting the depth at all? That makes it worse if I try and do single leg off the leg press because now I'm not having the stability from the other leg. So now that leg's going under more load Rather than, consider, yeah. yeah obviously with the two legs it's it's sort of stabilizing it from the other and taking some of the pressure off as soon as i go to one leg oh my god no straight away it wants to fucking snap off me straight away um and i, and I get treated every single week i get osteo once a month and i get a sports massage every single week and it's like it's just my body's just not letting go <laughs> you know it's just your nervous system, isn't it? It just wants to contract and make sure you're not going into any range where it's going to be even more yeah. light or you know, anything like that. Maybe I need to just smoke a spliff before I go and train legs and then it might let go, but... <laughs> or have a vape. Yeah. Have a vape, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll vape there before I go to bed. That's all planned. <laughs> These are the... Uh... The THC vapes are the only vapes that I take. <laughs> I've got one of them as well. I've got the uh, what is it, the, the space one? Indica. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember what you said. Actually, OG or something like that. That's it. See, I'd be more interested in trying that than a normal vape. Yeah, the the good, the fucking strong. But this one's strong. This is two thousand milligrams. This one. Oh shit! Fucking hell. From Cali, I got two of them. So uh, maybe don't start it. on that one. Oh, mate, I'm a seasoned veteran, mate. I've been talking on it all day yesterday. I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess uh, one thing you also wanted to talk about, JT, was um, the coaching industry. That's it, yeah. That's what we said when we were Don't, don't start on that. We'll be here all fucking night. <laughs> um, so let's keep this one short and sweet and let's try and not upset too many people and not get clipped up in a uh, in a reel <laughs> we, uh, we normally do. It offends someone. So where do we start with this? Because it's fucking hell. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff. Well, I, I think um, Josh started the conversation earlier when he talked about female clients and kind of some of the situations they've been in before that. I think that is probably one of the messier sides of it because there is a lot that can get fucked up there um, in the female side of things, to put it bluntly. <laughs> so, well, so what do you I find, know. Josh, with clients? Like, what, what situations they've been in before? Well... I mean, me personally, obviously, I get most of my sort of examples through Josh, obviously, like case studies and learning that he goes through with me and stuff like this. But like one of the one of the most scariest things that I ever saw was um, when a client that came to Josh and uh, the previous coach had her on SUS, which is essentially three types of tests. And Josh got her blood work. And I think she ended up on 90 nanomoles of test. Fuck. And That's I was just crazy. like, what the fuck? This means nothing That's... to me, but it sounds bad. Um, <laughs> so like, like, they're like, say, for example, say it's like triple what your top end of test would be naturally as a man. Wow, fucking hell. Was she like viralizing? She, the voice had started to go and then she came off everything and then joined Josh and he was just like basically said we've got nowhere to go now with this he's like we're essentially never going to be able to use anything with you ever again because obviously the sort of safer model use for females that sort of Josh and Joe Jeff sort of have sort of put out in the industry sort of and trying to avoid in terms of androgen use is like and even if you are going to use androgen use you're sort of you only really want to expose a female to that sort of eight weeks across a year and it's like you're talking like 40 milligrams a week for like four weeks at a time and like spreads them out across and it's like that's using like so like for example connor testosterone for men 
comes in 250 or 300 meg per mil. Femtest comes in 10 meg per mil. And then she was being given sus, which is essentially at the male doses of what she was taking. And then it's put her at three times a nat natural man's testosterone level, when normally I think their cap out is like eight. Is it like eight nanomoles or something like this? Or maybe even lower than that, actually. I'm not too sure. Yeah. You what, sorry? I'm not too sure what the female actual like test base I'm line is. I'm just having a look now. It, it, yeah. Like, it, this, this isn't a, a joke of a it's question, good. but was she massive? Oh. Did she have a lot of muscle? 1.6 nanomoles is the most for females, and she was 90. Um, no, from the photos, from the photos I saw, I mean, she looked like she trained and everything like that side of things. I think she was just very, very lucky, um, in that in that sense. But I think, like, definitely from a female's perspective, I think as well, like, uh, and one of the things that comes across that I've seen from female coaches and also affecting on females as well is that when other coaches treat them like little men, like that they, they can just more cardio, more this, less food, less this. And like the, in the reality is like most females need more diet breaks. Like they have more hormones that dictate everything through a week, through a fucking four weekly cycle that affects things, slows things down, stops things. And so they often need a break, a refeed, put back up to maintenance, it's not always more, more, more. So, I mean, that's why you see, I've, I can't, I'm not going to say his name, but he made a post. It was like, it's easy to diet women. They just do this, just do this. Bear in mind, he doesn't coach a single woman, but people seem to see, think that, that it's just easy coaching women that you just starve them and you just put loads of cardio in. And it's just like, I've even had it with a female PT that came and coached to me. She didn't have regular cycles for over six months. And, it came down to the fact that she was doing 20 minutes cardio a day. Yeah. We took the 20 minutes cardio out. We just put steps in. Her cycles came back regular. Okay, because the amount of stress that she's being exposed to. Just from 20 minutes on the Stairmaster. And obviously, what's a girl's favorite toy? Outside of obviously what's in their drawer. is the Stairmaster. It just goes to show you, hey, but the, there is that that's like everyone's got that individuality anyway but then when it comes to females you've got this whole other layer and like uh, for me I, I got introduced to it back when I done the M10 mentorship and they kind of talked through the menstrual cycle and that was certain effects that you're going to feel in certain stages of the cycle and that I, I can't believe how frequently I use that information like at the time you're about like okay this is like this is like maybe a bit too deep for me but fuck me i use it constantly you, you're like referring back to that quite a lot um, and it is it isn't it isn't the same as coaching a man no by no means no you can within reason you can't really fuck a man up but you can do some serious irreversible damage to a female um and i think like the, the industry at the moment is like is is a big area that we need to focus more on and how we obviously look at women. And I think even like the research and everything, the data and drug use and everything like that is still obviously very minimal. And it's very anecdotal. Do you know what I mean? In the, even in the grand scheme of things, because I'm sure JT, do you know what I mean, you'll know, like looking at the studies and things like that, the majority are done on men. Do you know what yeah. I mean? If they are, if they are done. Um, when, it, when it comes to like the drug use stuff as well. So like in the clinical setting mostly like when you look at the drug use stuff it's all in like patients and especially like cancer patients and anything like in that regards when there's been a number of time it was it like Decca, fucking winstrel anavar all that stuff it's all been used in like a clinical setting it's not been used on like normal people from the studies i've seen and especially like with the females so it's hard to actually use with a competitor and especially like obviously in those circumstances, it's sort of like you'll do anything. Do you know what I mean? Like if you've cancer, do you know what I mean? Like life risking injuries and it's going to make you feel slightly stronger, great gain some muscle mass and things like this. They're not going to give a shit by some hairs sprouting, do you know what I mean? And things like this, because it's like their, their cost reward at that point is like, it's going to be more reward. And it's just like, but I could see why they used them though, or like the actual basis of using them, just because obviously it's going to increase the HT, it's going to reduce estrogen, especially like breast cancer patients, stuff like I've read into that. And they're using things like Nandrolone and that, and um, making sure it's like reducing 
the actual estrogen. So there's a basis behind it, but then I don't think they're doing that anymore. And there's a reason why they're not doing it. <laughs> yeah. But it's like one of the big things I see in the industry at the moment is the HRT and coaches saying, I've given my client HRT. The reality is you haven't given them HRT. You've given them Femtest, but you've not given them progesterone. You've not given them estrogen. You've just given them Femtest. And I think that's a big thing that I'm seeing in the industry at the moment. And it's like, well, they're on HRT and all of a sudden they've got jacked. And it's like, this is no longer therapeutic dosages, is it? Like, and it's just like, oh no, look at my girls. They're all getting massive. And it's like HRT, HRT. And it's like, come on. Like, it's, it's, it's fucking scary the way, like, um, like for me, again, on the natural side of things, when you're talking about the coaching standards and things like that, I'm like, you know, people maybe, you know, not teaching their clients how to properly do a fucking exercise is what I'm talking about, or, you know, dieting them on low calories. But see, on the, the steroid side of things, like, that is, it's fucking crazy what's going on, isn't it? It's fucking scary. Like, people could literally be killing people um, with what they're doing. It's, 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 you know. Is that guy, I, the, what's he called, that guy who's been killing people all the time at Shelby, Coke? Shelby Starnes. I'd say, yeah, he literally kills a couple of people every year. He's fucking mad. He's got a record for it. Well, uses like four different diuretics at a time with a female. Like that's that's it. You know, it's not really what you want to be known for, is it? No, but I feel so like, I feel like at the moment as well, because I get very frustrated because like as a coach of what I am, health is a big priority for me. Like that's been driven into me from Josh. Do you know what I mean? We don't do stupid shit. We don't push people's health just for fucking trophies or for the chances of first places. And you sound like a fucking whiny little bitch to the rest of the industry or gen pop when you're trying to highlight these issues. And it's like, you go, yeah, but that's great that the, so the, the, cause the reality is most of the top level coaches in the industry at the moment, or, and I say top level when I mean, I mean, results, like, I mean, who's winning, who's the coach behind everyone that's winning shows. Those people care less about what drugs they're giving to their clients i'm just looking up this guy now there's a lot of females on this page and to be fair oh, they're well, great condition. He, he like he's a very high level pro le level thing but but if people are like dying stuff. like you shouldn't be getting away with that like you shouldn't be able to still be going to see his last post was fucking earlier this month oh yeah mate. he he weathered that storm completely fine and just like was just like and then just went quiet on social media for a few months and then because the reality is those top level competitors don't give a fuck. Like <laughs> they don't give a fuck. And it's the same as the, the the clients that are behind the coaches that are winning everything now. You'd probably be horrified by the amount of drugs that they're pushing on them and also the rhyme or reason like push on them. It's like I won't say his name, but there was a coach that is probably the top male coach at the moment. And he put diazide in with one of his clients and my friend Deck was questioning him on the fact that he took water out when he put the diazide in. And he was like, well, where's the water and the carbohydrates going to go? And he was just like, oh yeah, we'll just put that back in the morning. And it's like, they just ignored him and put his water in the night. And then he, the client landed perfectly on the show, but it's like, imagine how dangerous that would have been. Like, taking a diuretic and not keeping fluid in because obviously a diuretic will remove fluid from your body but you, you have meant to keep putting fluid in and keep uh, dink and it's just like he's just like now nah, we'll just and even someone questioned him and then he was like mm, and then it was just like gave a shitty answer and then fucking scurried off somewhere and it's like because they don't care like they just want to put something in their bio that's going to say that you've got so many wins because then regardless who then leaves them more will come through do you know what i mean like my favorite coaching organization i call them the meat grinder because no matter how many people leave them there's another 10 that have come through on social media that haven't seen the reason why five people have left and it's just like i know it, frust that. it frustrates me so much as a coach because like i actually give a shit and i actually care and it's like, it all taps into like showing like what I've always ranted to JT about, but it's like, when you hear about coaches taking six days to respond to clients, taking a month to respond to blood work, like a month to respond to blood work, like that's 
important it's your client's health like you could have some drugs in there that you need to instantly change or pull out or do anything like this and it's just like there just seems to be a constant fix of like and i get it because believe me i crashed hard after the end of this season with dopamine as a coach i was like oh my god the end of the season's over like no more clients being put on stage i was like i was lost i felt like an absolute dopamine crash so for these notoriety popular coaches that are on a constant dopamine high and people flooding into their inbox and paying them money and their bank accounts are going through the roof i can i can understand where you start getting complacent and you're like well it worked for someone else and it's just like but eventually something's going to happen do you know what i mean eventually that that can't be sustained and also like we then tap back into what we were saying earlier about like demonizing bodybuilding because us as coaches aren't aren't acting accordingly but one thing i that also baffles me with the industry is that you will have all these top level coaches all of the putting x amount in their bio of how many wins they've got how many swords they've got how many pro cards they've got one sign never choose a coach that does that that would be always my advice to anyone because they care about more about the wins rather than you as a person and the development of what they've put you in as a person but the biggest sort of, I'm just trying to think, my mind's gone blank now. But it's just like, you should care. You should give a shit. That was it. But they, they're coaching high level athletes that are also coaches themselves, well known coaches themselves. But these also well known coaches are essentially selling their soul by allowing their coach to, to respond six days to a check in, to respond a month to a check in because of who they are, because then if they get posted on their page as being one of their clients, then that brings them notoriety. So it's like, whereas I think like- It, it, it gets me, passed down then as well, doesn't it? Like funneled down. Exactly. Whereas like, if it was me, it's like, like, and I was like with one of these coaches and I was like, I'm not getting the service that I pay for. And I'm like, I'd be blowing them up on social media going, this isn't good enough. Because it's like these coaches are also the first things to say when you try and leave and go, oh, no, you've got to give a month's notice or you've got to give two months notice. And it's like, but you didn't even fucking, you took fucking a month to respond to my blood work. You took over nearly into the second week of check-in to just even acknowledge me as a human being. Like, so I'm just like, I feel like us as the industry are also very much responsible for also allowing these coaches because we all just want to be like, Oh yeah, it's just I don't want to get into it. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to get into it. And it's like, but w how we we're not um, what's the word? We're not regulated, so we have to self-regulate, and we have to self-regulate by, by blowing people up on social media when the service isn't good enough. Because until we get to a point where that, like, we've got to be accountable as coaches. Do you know what I mean? Like, if Josh was doing that, I'd be like, this isn't good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like someone asked me the other day, he was like, oh, if you could be coached by anyone, who would it be? I was like, I'm already coached by him. I was like, literally, his, his service is class. I message him, sometimes he's got back to me within two minutes. I'm like, fucking hell. You don't get that off any other coach in the industry. So when you check in, I'm getting my check-in back within like an hour or so as well. So he's on the ball with it. He's absolutely nailing it. So especially, especially like with Josh being like, usually when he's at peak numbers, he's around 120 to 140 clients. And well, he still provides that service to every single one of them. Well, like, don't get me wrong, Nick. Nick will probably tear her hair out that he's that he's working too much and things like this. But he's given a shit to every single one of those clients, and it's just like that makes a big difference. And it's like, yeah, I'm coached by Josh. Like, I'm thinking that I'll, I'm going to possibly leave Josh after this season and go to Joe Jeff. But that's possibly just for my own leg education learning. And to be under another mentor, it's got nothing representation of Josh in any way, shape or form. It's just I've been with Josh for four years and it's like, I'm a coach. I work for his company. Josh is always going to be my mentor, but then I need, I want to have another opportunity of another mentor. Josh is and coached by Joe as well, isn't it? So Josh is coached by Joe. So it's like, it just seems as a natural progression to me, do you know what I mean? That I can also be under Joe, get more learning and, and ask Joe things in that moment and time and things like this. 
and also like obviously have no fault to, to Josh as well like but uh, which is and trust me is it a frustration of his as well is that obviously he is majority female so he he wants to coach more males he wants to be exposed to more males but obviously the way his business is set up it is more majority female based so it's like for more further learning when it comes to male that's another reason why I'm I'm going to go for another mentor as well but don't get me wrong I'll I'll probably be back to Josh because I just love being coached by him because he keeps it simple I mean all these coaches in the industry that bang on about 1% and everything else we're going to fall out very quickly and like we're never going to gel and we're never going to get anything out of each other so it's like I've also got to make sure that I pick and like being able to see Josh's relationship with Joe and also being able to speak to Joe at shows and how Joe is and like how he is and stuff like this and don't get me wrong like what you said he can go two bit science based and things like this but he has a rationale for you do you know what I mean he has a reason for you rather than it's just like oh, I just did it because which I think is I think is a ma- is a big thing like coaches make mistakes coaches fuck up of course they do we all got to allow for that we're all human but I think when they don't just say, I don't know, or I'll find out, or there isn't a, a why behind what they do. That's when it starts getting a bit, I'm just like, Wing this it. doesn't, yeah. And you've got people's health in there. And I think as, as, as an online coach, as a personal trainer, as whatever we do, our, our basis and our foundation has always been health and well-being of our clients, is it not? Definitely. Absolutely. It's a nice place to wrap that up, actually. It's a nice way to finish up. This is our longest ever podcast. <laughs>